on the like and subscribe buttons. Your support will be greatly Chapter appreciated. One. The Nature of the Gathering Storm In this year of the quincentenary of Christopher Columbus's alleged discovery of the Caribbean islands and the Americas, collectively called the New World, there is a need not only to re-examine the myth of Columbus, but the broader myth of Europe and its people and the consequences of their expansion beyond their shores in the 15th and 16th century. This event needs an explanation over and above the fact of their expansion. As a classroom teacher, I have referred to the years between 1400 and 1600 as the Christopher Columbus era. I know full well that this era started before Columbus was born. This was a point in history when Europeans freed themselves from the lethargy of the Middle Ages, the aftermath of the Crusades and the famines and plagues that had taken one-third of the population of Europe. It is also the period when Europeans freed themselves from almost a thousand-year fear of Islam and what they referred to as the infidel Arabs, who had been controlling the Mediterranean and its trade routes since the decline of the Roman Empire in the middle of the 7th century. The renewal of European nationalism, the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, the expulsion of the Arabs, Moors, and the Jews from Spain in 1492, and the introduction of the slave trade gave Europe a new economic lease on life. Europeans had to create a rationale and a series of myths to justify their new position and what they intended to extract from non-European people. Some of the myths set in motion by what I have referred to as the Columbus era still plague the world today. With the Atlantic slave trade the Europeans had set in motion, a holocaust for African people that is still active in some form on the 500th year anniversary of Christopher Columbus's alleged discovery, they had also set in motion an era of protracted genocide against non-European people that continues with its many dimensions in every place in the world where there is European influence over non-European people. At this point, there is a need to call attention to Michael Bradley's work, The Iceman Inheritance, that deals frankly with the rise and expansion of European racism, and the book by Francis Cress Welsing, The Isis Papers, that deals more specifically with the origins of white racism and how it affects African people. There weren't enough soldiers in Europe to take over the continent of Africa, India, the Caribbean islands, and both South and North America. The greatest achievement of the Europeans was the conquest of the mind of their victims through a series of myths that could bear re-examining in order to understand the deeper meaning of the Christopher Columbus era and its reverberations for today. 1. The myth of a people waiting in darkness for another people to bring them the light. In most countries where the Europeans invaded or influenced, they put out the light of local civilizations and culture and destroyed civilizations, civilizations that were old before Europeans were born. 2. The myth of a people without a legitimate god. Europeans made no serious attempt to understand the religious cultures of non-European people wherever they went in the world. If their God concept was not in agreement with the Europeans, then the Europeans assured them that they had no God worthy of worship. 3. The myth of the primitive and the aborigine. Here we have a misrepresentation of two worlds that originally meant first or the original. European interpretation was derogatory and downgrading, and it still is. In many ways, the Europeans were saying to non-European people that they did not have the right to choose a god or a culture different from that of the Europeans. 4. The myth of the invader and conqueror as civilizer. Generally speaking, no people ever spread any civilization anywhere or at any time in human history through invasion and conquest. The invader and the conqueror spreads his way of life at the expense of his victims. They generally destroy civilization in the name of civilization. In this initial expansion, the Europeans not only colonized history, they colonized information about history. The most disastrous of all their colonizations was the colonization of the image of God. They denied the conquered people the right to see God through their own imagination or to address God in a world that came from their own language. Every effort was made to wipe from their memory how they ruled the state and how they related to their spirituality before the coming of the Europeans. Most of the people of the world were forced to forget that over half of human history was over before anyone knew that a European was in the world. Non-Europeans, especially in Nile Valley civilizations, had laid the basis for the spirituality that would later be converted into the major religions of the world. They had also developed the thought pattern 
that would later be developed into the philosophical thought of the world. All of this had happened outside of Europe before Europeans had names, durable shoes or houses with windows. In order to understand Christopher Columbus, the African Holocaust and the protracted era of genocide set in motion by the Christopher Columbus era, we must re-examine the year 1492 and give it a significance over and above what happened in Europe. At this point, it is essential that we look back in order to look forward with more understanding. Too many times it is assumed that African history began with the slave trade. There were a thousand years of independent state formation and state management in inner West Africa called the Western Sudan before the slave trade. This period of independent African political and cultural activity needs to be reviewed in order to understand, at least in part, what West Africa lost in the slave trade. Professor Van Sertema has said that African history has been locked into a 500-year room. I have extended this by saying that African history has been locked behind a slavery curtain. It is necessary to look at West African history before and after the slave trade in order to understand how and why the slave trade occurred and why African people, more than any other people in the world, were its main victims. The Africans were open-minded and politically naive in their relationship with non-African people, especially the European. So they did not know the intentions and the temperament of the Europeans then, and they do not know it now. Chapter 2. Africa, Before the Slave Trade My approach to this subject, on reflection, might seem overly ambitious because most of the writers who have dealt with the African slave trade that began in the 15th and 16th centuries have not acknowledged that an age of grandeur came before this agony that changed Africa and the world for all time to come. When I speak of Africa's age of grandeur, I am referring to the last flowering of state and empire building in the western Sudan, inner West Africa. Before the breaking up of the coastal states and the spread of the slave trade to other areas, this is the forgotten age of grandeur whose loss helped to make the West African slave trade possible. I generally divide African history into three arbitrary categories. There is nothing scientific about my method. It is a utility developed in order to simplify an overall approach to African history. In dividing African history into ages of grandeur that I call the first, second, and third golden age, I am saying to students that most people in the world would have had an age of grandeur or a golden age, have had only one. As did the Romans, the Greeks rose and fell and never rose again. I maintain that African people have had three golden ages and could have a fourth one. What does this say about our potential and our ability to bounce back from defeat and decline and be a total people again? There is a need now to look back on Africa's golden ages and the main currents of African history that led to the decline of the last age of grandeur and the beginning of the slave trade. It can be said with a strong degree of certainty that Africa has had three golden ages. The first two reached their climax and were in decline before Europe as a functioning entity in human society was born. Africa's first golden age began at the beginning, with the birth of man and the development of organized societies. It is generally conceded in most scholarly circles that mankind originated in Africa. This provides a basis for the theory that African man was the father and African woman the mother of humankind. In this book, The Progress and Evolution of Man in Africa, Dr. L. S. B. Leakey states that, in every country that one visits and where one is drawn into a conversation about Africa, the question is regularly asked by people who should know better. But what has Africa contributed to world progress? The critics of Africa forget that men of science today, with few exceptions, are satisfied that Africa was the birthplace of man himself, and that for many hundreds of centuries thereafter, Africa was in the forefront of all human progress. Leakey, 1961-1. In the early development of man, the family was the most important unit in existence. Through the years, the importance of this unit has not changed. The first human societies were developed for reasons relating to the needs and survival of the family. The early African had to make hooks to catch fish, spears to hunt with, and knives. He searched for new ways of building shelter gathering and raising food, and domesticating animals. Our use of fire today simply continues the process started by the early Africans, the control of fire. 
In the making of tools that set man apart from all living creatures, Africans started man along the tool-making path. With the discovery of metals and how to use them, all Africa took a great leap forward. Man had learned how to take iron from the ground and turn it into spears and tools. Iron cultures spread rapidly across Africa, and there were very few parts of Africa that were not influenced by these Iron Age cultures. Iron cultures had the greatest development in the area of Africa that is now the eastern Sudan in the great city of Moro. The use of iron accelerated every aspect of African development and introduced a new danger, the eventual use of iron weapons in warfare. Philipson, 1977, pages 102 to 227. The Nile River became a great cultural highway, bringing peoples and cultures out of inner Africa. These migrations by river led to the establishment of one of the greatest nations in world history, Egypt. In this book, The Destruction of Black Civilization, Great Issues of a Race from 4500 B.C. to 2000 A.D., the African-American historian, Chancellor Williams, 1974, refers to Egypt as Ethiopia's oldest daughter and calls attention to the evidence to prove the southern African origin of early Egyptian people and their civilization. Pages 62 to 124. Egypt first became an organized nation about 6,000 B.C. Medical interest centers upon a period in the 3rd Dynasty, 5345 to 5307 B.C., when Egypt had an ambitious pharaoh named Zoser, and Zoser, in turn, had for his chief counsel and minister a brilliant commoner named Imhotep, whose name means, He Who Cometh in Peace. Although Egypt gave the world some of the greatest personalities in the history of mankind, Imhotep is singularly outstanding. In the ancient history of Egypt, no individual left a deeper impression than the commoner Imhotep. He was the world's first multi-genius. He was also the real father of medicine. Imhotep constructed the famous Step Pyramid of Saqqara near Memphis, and the building methods used in the construction of this pyramid revolutionized the architecture of the ancient world. Jackson, 1978, pages 3 through 35. In this book, Evolution of Modern Medicine, Sir William Osler, 1921, refers to Imhotep as the first figure of a physician to stand out clearly from the mists of antiquity. The period in Egyptian history from the Third Dynasty to the first invasion of Egypt from the Hyksos, or Shepherd Kings, in 1675 B.C. is, in my opinion, the apex of the First Golden Age. The Western Asian domination over Egypt lasted about 420 years and was ended by the rise of Egyptian nationalism during the 17th dynasty and era. It would later develop into a state with a known history of more than a thousand years. In Europe and in the Arab countries, Ghana was known as a country rich in gold. This was a natural attraction for the Arabs and later the Europeans. The country reached the height of its greatness during the reign of Tenkemenen one of its greatest kings, who came to power in 1062 A.D. The king lived in a palace of stone and wood, which was built to be defended in time of war. The empire was well organized. The political progress and social well-being of its people could be favorably compared to the best kingdoms and empires that prevailed in Europe at the time. The country had a military force of 200,000 men, Wingfield, 1957. In one of a number of holy wars, or jihads, Ghana was invaded by the Almoravides under the leadership of Abu Bekr of the Soso Empire in 1076 AD. This conquest brought an end to Ghana's age of prosperity and cultural development. The character of the country was slow to change. Nearly a hundred years later, the Arab writer El Idrisi wrote of it as being the greatest kingdom of the blacks, Buha, 1974, page 171. In a later account, El Idrisi said, Ghana is the most commercial of the black countries. It is visited by rich merchants from all the surrounding countries and from the extremities of the West. Bua, 1974, page 6. In 1087, Ghana regained its independence, but without regaining its old strength, state organization, and grandeur. The ruins of the empire of Ghana became the kingdoms of Daira and Soso. The provinces of Ghana became a part of the Mali Empire and were later absorbed into the Songhai Empire. The great drama of state building, trade and commerce, and power brokerage unfolded at Timbuktu, 
the queen city of the western Sudan. Two hundred miles down the Niger from Timbuktu, the competing city of Gao stood. It was founded about the 7th century A.D. and was the capital of the large black empire of Songhai. Like Timbuktu, it was in a favorable position for the trans-Saharan trade in the days of the regular caravans from North Africa. Also, like Timbuktu, the greatest days of Gao came in the 15th and 16th centuries. Du Bois, 1969. Pages 189 to 274. In the years when Timbuktu was the great intellectual nucleus of the Songhai Empire, African scholars were enjoying a renaissance that was known and respected throughout most of Africa and in parts of Europe. At this period in African history, the University of Sankor was the educational capital of the Western Sudan. In his book, Timbuktu, the Mysterious, Felix Du Bois gives us the following picture. The scholars of Timbuktu yielded in nothing to the saints and their sojourns in the foreign universities of Fez, Tunis, and Cairo. They astounded the most learned men in Islam by their erudition. That these Negroes were on a level with the Arabian savants is proved by the fact that they were installed as professors in Morocco and Egypt. In contrast to this, we find that the Arabs were not always equal to the requirements of Sankor. Du Bois, 1969, page 275. The famous emperor of Mali, Mansa, Musa, stopped at Timbuktu on his pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324. He went in regal splendor with an entourage of 60,000 persons, including 1,200 servants. 500 bondsmen, each of whom carried a staff of pure gold, marched in front of the emperor. 280 camels bore 2,400 pounds of gold, which this African monarch distributed as alms and gifts. Musa returned from Mecca with an architect who designed imposing buildings in Timbuktu and other parts of his realm. Bohen, 1969, pages 9 through 17. To the outside world of the late medieval period, the emperor Mansa Musa was more than an individual. He was Africa. He conquered the Songhai Empire and rebuilt the University of Sankor. He figured by name on every map. In his lifetime, he became the symbol of the mystery and the fabulous wealth of the unknown African continent. He was the most colorful of the black kings of the 14th century. He still held this position nearly two centuries after his death. After the death of Mansa Musa, the empire of Mali declined in importance. In place was taken by Songhai, whose greatest king was Askia the Great, Mohammed Torre. Askia came to power in 1493, one year after Columbus landed in America. He consolidated the territory, conquered by the previous ruler Sony Ali, and built Songhai into the most powerful state in the western Sudan. His realm, it is said, was larger than all Europe. The German writer Henry Barth, in his famous work Travels and Discoveries in North and Central Africa, 1857, calls Askia the Great one of the most brilliant and enlightened administrators of all times, page 667. He reorganized the army of Songhai, improved the system of banking and credit, and made the city-states of Gao Walada, Timbuktu, and Zhen into intellectual centers. Timbuktu, during his reign, was a city of more than 100,000 people, a city filled to the top, says a chronicler of that time. With gold and dazzling women, Felix Du Bois, page 250. Askia encouraged scholarship and literature. Students from all over the Muslim world came to Timbuktu to study grammar, law, and surgery at the University of Sankor. Scholars came from North Africa and Europe to confer with learned historians and writers of this black empire. Many books were written and a Sudanese literature developed. Leo Africanus, who wrote one of the best-known works of the Western Sudan, says, In Timbuktu, there are numerous judges, doctors, and clerics, all receiving good salaries from the king. He pays great respect to men of learning. There is a big demand for books and manuscripts imported from Barbary, North Africa. More profit is made from the book trade than from any other line of business. Askia had been hailed as one of the wisest monarchs of the Middle Ages. Alexander Chamberlain, 1911, in his book, The Contribution of the Negro to Human Civilization, says of him, In personal character, in administrative ability, in devotion to the welfare of his subjects, in open-mindedness towards foreign influences, and in wisdom in the adoption of enlightened ideas and institutions from abroad, King Askia was certainly the equal of the average European monarch of the time, and superior to many of them.
page 489. After the death of Askia the Great, in 1528, the Songhai Empire began to lose its strength and its control over its vast territory. When the Songhai Empire collapsed after the capture of Timbuktu and Gao by the Moroccans in 1591, the whole of the western Sudan was devastated by the invading troops. The Sultan of Morocco, El Mansur, had sent a large army with European firearms across the Sahara to attack the once powerful empire of Songhai. The army did not reach Timbuktu until 1591. The prosperous city of Timbuktu was plundered by the army of freebooters. A state of anarchy prevailed. The University of Sankor, which had stood for over 500 years, was destroyed, and the faculty exiled to Morocco. The greatest Sudanese scholar of that day, Ahmed Baba, was among those exiled. Baba was a scholar of great depth and inspiration. He was the author of more than 40 books on such diverse themes as theology, astronomy, ethnography, and biography. His rich library of 1,600 books was lost during his expatriation from Timbuktu, Clark, 1977, pages 142 to 147. Timbuktu provides the most tragic examples of the struggles of the West African states and towns as they strove to preserve what was once their golden age. The Arabs, Berbers, and Turks from the north showed them no mercy. Timbuktu had previously been sacked by the Turks as early as 1433, and they had occupied it for 30 years. Between 1591 and 1593, the Turks once more occupied and looted Timbuktu. Thus Timbuktu, once the queen city of the western Sudan, with more than 200,000 inhabitants and the center of a powerful state, degenerated into a shadow of its former stature. Now, West Africa entered a sad period of decline. During the Moorish occupation, wreck and ruin became the order of the day. When the Europeans arrived in this part of Africa and saw these conditions, they assumed that nothing of order and value had existed in these countries. The past golden ages are part of the history that the exploiters of Africa want the world to ignore. The great Ghanaian scholar, Dr. Joseph B. Dankwa, outlined the pre-slavery history of Africa in his introduction to the book United West Africa or Africa at the Bar of the Family of Nations, when he said, By the time Alexander the Great was sweeping the civilized world with conquest after conquest from Charonia to Gaza, from Babylon to Kabul, by the time this first of the Aryan conquerors was learning the rudiments of war and government at the feet of philosophic Aristotle, and by the time Athens was laying down the foundations of modern European civilization, the earliest and greatest Ethiopian culture had already flourished and dominated the civilized world for over four centuries and a half. Imperial Ethiopia had conquered Egypt and founded the 25th dynasty, and for a century and a half, the central seat of civilization in the known world was held by the ancestors of the modern Negro, maintaining and defending it against the Assyrian and Persian empires of the East. Thus, at the time, when Ethiopia was leading the civilized world in culture and conquest, East was West. But West was not, and the first European, Gratian, Olympiad, was as yet to be held. Rome was nowhere to be seen on the map, and 16 centuries were to pass before Charlemagne would rule in Europe and Egbert become first king of England. Even then, history was to drag on for another 700 weary years before Roman Catholic Europe could see fit to end the Great Schism, soon to be followed by the disturbing news of the discovery of America and by the fateful rebirth of the youngest of world civilizations. In this young civilization, a need for slavery was created. This need had an unforeseen effect upon African people, the magnitude of which continues to be experienced to the present day. When the Europeans first came down the west coast of Africa, they were treated as guests by the unsuspecting Africans whom they would later enslave. When the Africans began to suspect that the intentions of the Europeans were not good, in most cases, it was too late and they did not have the modern weapons of that day to defend themselves. In his book, Ghana, The Morning After, Kebudu Akwa, 1960, explains the efforts of one king of the country that would later be called the Gold Coast, now Ghana, to save his people from the slave trade. His name was Nana Kwamina Ansa. His attempt to discourage the Portuguese from settling in his country was met with force. The following is Budu Aqua's explanation of his effort. Our forefathers' antipathy to imperialism 
is exemplified by the speech of Nana Anza, who foresaw clearly that they were going to be called upon to prey on one another, to be left helpless, disorganized, and demoralized. His speech had been quoted by the late Mr. Mansa Sarba, Dr. de Graft Johnson, and others. And it is worth quoting once more from W. W. Claridge's History of the Gold Coast and Ashante, for it shows equally well the development of the Akan language, its poetry, which is as perfect and musical as any Latin or Roman language, and if the darkness of a language to be an index to the natural eloquence of the Akan people, it is a sure indication of a balanced and highly developed mental equipment. In his speech to Diego de Azambuya, commander of the Portuguese expedition, King Anza said, I am not insensible to the higher honor which your great master, the chief of Portugal, has this day conferred upon me. His friendship I have always endeavored to merit by the strictness of my dealings with the Portuguese and by my constant exertions to procure an immediate lading of the vessels. But never until this day did I observe such a difference in the appearance of his subjects. They have hitherto been meanly attired, were easily contended with the commodity they received, and so far from wishing to continue in this country, were never happy until they could complete their lading and return. Now I remake a strange difference. A great number, richly dressed, are anxious to be allowed to build houses and to continue among us. Men of such eminence, conducted by a commander who from his own account seems to have descended from the God who made day and night, can never bring themselves to endure the hardships of this climate, nor would they here be able to procure any of the luxuries that abound in their own country. The passions that are common to us all men will therefore inevitably bring on disputes, and it is far preferable that both our nations should continue on the same footing, as they hitherto have done allowing your ships to come and go as usual. The desire of seeing each other occasionally will preserve peace between us. The sea and the land, being always neighbors, are continually at variance and contending who shall give way. The sea with great violence attempting to subdue the land, and the land with equal obstinacy resolving to oppose the sea. Boudou Aqua, 1960, pages 23 through 24. The Portuguese were not impressed by the eloquence of King Anza's speech. They forced their way into his country and built the first permanent slave trading settlement in West Africa. The year was 1482. Kebudu Aqua explains the tragedy in the following statement. This was the beginning of European colonization, the beginning of the hunting ground for procuring slave labor, the distribution of our religion, our social systems, the loss of respect for our forefathers, all these things being taken away without anything of value being put in their place. 1960, page 24. It is evident that the European colonization was instrumental in bringing about the decline of the third of Africa's golden ages. Therefore, this history of exploitation and the responsibility for the present condition of the societies of the third golden age are understandably attributed to the greed and imperialistic goals of the European nations on the like and subscribe button. Your support will be greatly appreciated.